Witchcraft and its effect you never knew. Witchcraft encompasses a vast range of topics. Volumes on the topic are so numerous that they would fill a library. It has been practiced throughout human history and by all civilizations. Still today many fall into its clutches. Many priests underestimate the danger of witchcraft. While they rightly trust in the salvific power of Jesus, who died to free us from Satan's bonds, they forget that the Lord never told us to underestimate the devil's power, he never told us to defy him or to stop fighting him. Instead God gave us the power to expel demons and talked of our endless struggle against him who asks to sift us. Jesus himself underwent temptations by Satan and showed us clearly that we cannot serve two masters. It is amazing how often the Bible warns against witchcraft and sorcerers, both in the Old and the New Testaments. Scripture warns us that witchcraft is one of the most common means used by the devil to bind men to himself and to dehumanize them. Directly or indirectly, witchcraft is a cult of Satan. Those who practice any sort of magic believe that they can manipulate superior powers, but in reality it is they who are manipulated. Witch doctors believe that they own good and evil. Mediums and spiritualists invoke powerful spirits or the souls of the dead, without realizing that they have given themselves body and soul to demonic powers. Even if it is not immediately evident, these powerful spirits always use their minions for destructive purposes. When man is separated from God, he is poor and unhappy, he is unable to understand the meaning of life, and even less the meaning of hardships, suffering, and death. He longs for the happiness that the world holds out as a lure, wealth, power, health, love, pleasure, and admiration. It seems as though the devil is saying, if you, then, will worship me, it shall all be yours, LK 4-6-7. Thus we see everyone, young and old, women, laborers, professionals, politicians, and actors, seeking the truth about their future. This sort of crowd will always find another crowd, sorcerers, soothsayers, astrologers, card readers, prana therapists, and fortune tellers of all kinds. Those who turn to them are motivated by chance, or hope, or desperation, or as an experiment. Some become victims, others remain bound, still others enter into the closed-end circle of sections. What is behind all this? The ignorant believe it is only superstition, curiosity, fiction, fraud, in fact, it generates large sums of money. In reality, magic is not only a silly superstition, something without basis, it is also a recourse to demonic powers to influence the course of events or to manipulate others for personal profit. This deviant form of religiosity, which was typical among primitive peoples, has persisted throughout time and continues to coexist side by side with many religions in every country. Although its forms are many, the result is one, to distance man from God in order to lead him to sin and spiritual death. There are two kinds of magic, imitative and contagious. Imitative magic is based on the concept of similarity in form and practice, it rests on the principle that everything generates something similar. A puppet represents the target, and, after the appropriate, ritual prayers, which are recited while piercing the body of the puppet with pins, the victim will also feel pierced and begin to suffer pain or illness in the same parts of the body that were pierced in the puppet. Contagious magic is based on the principle of physical contact, or contagion. To have influence over the target, the sorcerer must have access to something of his, such as hair, nail clippings, clothes. A photograph will do, better if it shows the entire body, the face must always be uncovered. In this type of magic, one part represents the whole. In other words, what is done to one part will have an effect on the entire person. Thus the sorcerer will use the appropriate rituals or formulas during pre-established times of the year and of the day. The evil work will come to fruition through the intervention of the spirits that he invokes. We have already talked about this when speaking about hexes, but witchcraft encompasses a much wider field than simple spells do, and greater still than the evil eye. In one of the rites of initiation into black magic, the witch doctors of the island of Green Cape claim that, at one point during the ritual, the novice will find himself in front of a mirror through which Satan himself will appear to grant him the powers and to place in his hands the weapons that he will use. The weapons that the Christian has against the roaring lion are truth, justice, faith, and the double-edged sword of God's word. 
Instead, the witch doctor will have a real sword to wound men. He will have the power of destruction, malediction, foresight, bilocation, healing, and more, according to what he will be expected to accomplish to obstruct God's plans and to what he is able to offer Satan. Besides himself, he can offer his children and other more or less naive individuals who turn to him for help. The victim of witchcraft will, at the very least, feel a great aversion for all that is sacred, prayer, churches, images. Instead his life will be filled with all sorts of unpredictable forms of evil. Once the sacrificial offering is made, and once the requested items, no matter how insignificant, are given, even the person who hired the sorcerer will often be affected. If you like this video, please help me by hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell, so you will not miss any new videos like this. The witch doctor brings this about by suggesting ceremonial rituals such as visiting seven churches, lighting candles in a specific manner, sprinkling special powder, or wearing prescribed objects. By these rituals the victims contract a more or less strong bond with the devil, the consequences for body and soul are always negative. Many times mothers bring their children to sorcerers who give them some items to wear, when the troubles begin, some come, to seek my help. To the inexperienced eye these items look like junk, but, because of evil consequences, they prove to be true curses. If we venture on enemy territory, we fall into his power even if we act, in good faith, and only God's powerful hand can free us from the ties by which we allow ourselves to be bound. The acts of so-called high magic can be classified as sacralization, consecration, blessings, destitutions, excommunications, and curses. The aim of all these actions is to transform objects and people into sacred symbols, naturally, consecrated to Satan. The magic material is magnetized at specific times, these are the objectives of magic astrology. Each sorcerer wears so-called pentacles and prepares them for others as well. The names derives from the Greek Pantaclea. They are generally metals whose symbols are energy catalysis. According to the sorcerer, these symbols possess a particular celestial power, and we must not confuse them with talismans. A talisman is something that is meant to represent some peculiarity of the individual whom they are supposed to protect. They are one of the greatest attractions for the unfortunate clients who feel struck by bad luck, misunderstandings, lack of love, or poverty, and who gladly pay the price, at times exorbitant, demanded for these lucky charms that are supposed to free them from all their problems. Instead, these individuals bring upon themselves such a negative energy that it will damage not only them but also their entire families. Incense is used abundantly in the preparation of all these objects, as in all sorts of magic activities. This incense is offered to Satan and is clearly meant as a counterpart to the liturgical incense we offer to God. Other forms of magic teach sorcerers how to prepare potions and other concoctions that generate a sensation of diabolical oppression in those who will consume them mixed with their food or drink. The victim will find not only disgusting objects in his body but also the evil spirits who were invoked during their preparation. The notorious love potion, which can force a horrible relationship, also called binding, is nothing less than a display of satanic power. The Bible speaks about the devil for the first time and he tempts our forefathers under the guise of a serpent. In mythology, the serpent is always associated with the personification of knowledge. In Egypt, it is the sorceress Isis who knows the secrets of rocks, plants, and animals. She knows illnesses and cures, therefore, she can reanimate the body of Osiris. The snake is always represented coiled on itself, with its tail in its mouth, a symbol of the eternal cycle of life. We can also recall the boa constrictor of the Inca emperors, or the sacred boa of the Indians. In voodoo, the androgynous snake Danbhala and Ida Weto guides its followers with a surety and precision that gives stunning results at any hour of day and night. This snake claims to know all the secrets of the creator verb through the magic language, whose power is increased by sacred music. This is Haitian magic, which together with the original African and the imported South American magic, particularly from Brazil, called Makum, has great evil power. I have already mentioned that the toughest curses I have ever exorcised came either from Brazil or Africa. Modern civilization managed to meld, but not change, some customs. Therefore, science and magic, religion and ancient practices cohabit in our world. 
Even today, especially in rural areas of Italy, very religious people turn to sorcerers as a remedy against all sorts of ills, from sickness to the evil eye, to find a job or a husband alike. We are talking about good people who always go to church. Just as some mothers still teach their children, in good faith, the gestures and the words required to remove the evil eye on the eve of Christmas, or who tie around the neck of their sons or daughters, along with chains holding crucifixes or sacred medals, hairs of badgers, teeth of wolves, or red horns. These are all objects that, even if they are not charged with negativity through magic rituals, have ties to Satan through the sin of superstition. Magic is always tied to divination, that is, the attempt to know our future through crooked paths. We only have to think of the popular custom of card reading, asking tarot cards to predict our future, this is the most common means of divination used by sorcerers and fortune tellers. It is believed that the origin of tarot cards goes back to the 13th century. It was introduced by gypsies, who condensed into this game of cards their power to predict the future. The basis for the game is an esoteric doctrine that claims to fix the relationship between man and the divine world. I am not going to expand on this topic. I merely want to point out that the naive person, stunned by the precision with which his past has been revealed, comes out of the session either in despair or full of futile hopes. He often becomes suspicious of his family and friends, and most especially he will form a sort of addiction to the individual who read his cards that will endure into the future and cause feelings of fear, rage, and uncertainty. He will constantly desire to turn to magic practices or to buy some talismans to counter the enemy inside, to whom he himself opened the door and who now is causing sickness, misfortune, etc. The worst magic of African origin is based on witchcraft, whose aim is to harm others through magic, and on spiritualism, which intends to contact the spirit of the dead or superior spirits. Spiritualism is practiced in every country and among all peoples. The medium is the intermediary between spirits and men, lending his energy, voice, gestures, writings, etc., to the spirit who wants to reveal himself. It may happen that these spirits, who are always and only demons, will possess some of those who participate in the seance. The church has always condemned seances and participation in them. We never learn anything useful by consulting Satan. Is it truly impossible to evoke the dead? Is it always and only demons who appear in seances? We know well that the doubt in the mind of believers is caused by one single exception. The Bible tells us that, when Saul turned to a medium and ordered her, divine for me by a spirit, and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you, 1 Sam 28 Samuel, who had been dead only a short while, truly appeared. God allowed this exception, but we should note the medium surprised scream and the even harsher reproof of Samuel, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? 1 Sam 28 The dead must be respected and not molested. Since this is the only occurrence in the entire Bible, I want to point to it as an exception. I fully agree with the writings of a Protestant exorcist and psychologist, it is sheer selfishness and cruelty to try and cling to our departed, or to want to call them back among us. What they need is eternal liberation, and not to become hobbled again by the things and the people of this world, Kenneth McCall, Fino Alaire Radisai, and Cora, p. 141. Many are tricked through their lack of faith and their ignorance. Endorsing certain dances, chants, clothes, and animals that are used in different voodoo or macum rituals may seem interesting from an ethnic or folkloric viewpoint. For candles at the four corners of a street or a triangle of candles, of which one points to the ground, may appear to be a game or a harmless superstition. It is time to open our eyes. I especially direct this invitation to priests, these are all attempts to evoke demon spirits that may or may not harm someone in the end, but whose ultimate goal is always to separate the victim from God, to lead him to sin, anguish, alienation, and despair. I have been asked if it is possible to strike an entire community through magic. My answer must be yes, however, this topic would require a separate research all by itself, and therefore I will limit my comments to a few points. It is possible for the demon to use one person to strike even a very large group, these groups can even take over or influence one or more nations. In our own times, I believe that this was the case of men such as Karl Marx, Hitler, and Stalin. The atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, the horrors of communism, 
the slaughters of Stalin, for example, reached diabolic proportions. Outside the political field, I do not hesitate in pointing to some music as a tool of Satan, as is the frenzy that some singers instigate in crowded places, often reaching peaks of extreme violence and destruction. There are other instances of evil influence, easier to control and to heal, although collective possessions have always been hard to cure. Some of these involved entire classrooms, associations, religious communities, and more. The demon's ability to trick and introduce errors of the worst kind into entire groups is incredible. There are those who insist that it is easier to trick a crowd than a single individual. It is certain that the devil can strike very large groups, however, almost always it is clear that human assent is involved, the human sin of free acceptance of satanic actions. The motives of this acceptance are many, wealth, power, vice, and more. The effect of Satan's influence on groups is one of the most destructive and powerful. This is why the popes, especially recent ones, insist on alerting us, for example, Paul V.I.'s speech of November 15, 1972, and John Paul II's speech of August 20, 1986. Satan is our worst enemy, and he will remain so until the end of time. Therefore he uses all his intellect and power in an attempt to thwart the plans of God, who wills the salvation of all. Our strength is the cross of Christ, his blood, his wounds, and obedience to his words and to his institution, the Church.